think we afford the baby sham to the musician.
middle finger, right? And you only go halfway round. One, two, three, knee, one, two, three, one, two, three, and cross, cross. One, two, three, and one, two, three, and one, two, three, and cross. Right. That was our whole hand. So let's do all the figures, lots of eight.
face your opposite and you get to the cross holds. Right? It's one, two, three. Right? Practice that. One, two, three. No. One, two, three. We only need two crosses. Oh.
Or stop talking. Come on over and join us. I've been a real miserable cross this failure. Well, we've got two closely related things to talk about this evening. One is the pagan origin of the Morris, and the second one is the Sizzler's Morris competition. <laughs> it's related this last night of discussion, any of it, which I must say was tremendous. We don't really have enough opportunity to do this. Well, we're getting into a problem. Um, the first time I met it, a lot of people objecting, is that my son-in-law came, or it belongs to one of these charismatic churches. And when he came down with my daughter to be introduced to the family, it was actually Minden Rose Day of Dance. And he came down to Walton to discover all his potential brothers in law dressed up in paper costumes. You know, um, this didn't quite match his religious scruples. <laughs> Uh, he was very worried about it all, you know, um, and it took a lot of explanation to say, hey, you know, every one of these is a Christian who attends a church, and, you know, um, et cetera, et cetera, you know, we really don't actually see it, and what's more, it hasn't got that ancient knowledge, we lied through our teeth, so he was a nice lad, really, um, and so on, but I mean, we've met this sort of problem, um, you don't have to be a Christian to get worried about pagan origins, things like this because of course unfortunately paganism equates most people's mind with evil mm. the evil side of you know black witchcraft mm. and so on and so on there are pagans in this country at the moment who are um not atheists you know they actually believe in a god and a goddess you know or the life forms things like this you know um, you may have heard of wicca unfortunately um people who believe in witchcraft who can never actually substantiate it's like um, faith healing and things like this, you know, it's very hard to get real evidence that it works. But as long as people actually believe it sincerely and live a good life as a result of it, who's going to complain? You know, um, I'm afraid that the so-called Christians of this world, you know, have actually uh, left a great record of death and destruction around the world. It was not Muslims who dropped the nuclear bomb and so on and so on, you know. Um, I don't really want to get into that, you know. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> bit careful about which position you're in, that's right, you know. Um, so, but yes, it does disturb people. And of course, we do have a tradition in the um, English church or in, or in the Western church of fighting against paganism for at least 400 AD, if not uh, earlier back. Now, what do we actually mean by it? You know, what were they actually on against? Well, paganism they were objecting to were the use of amulets, <coughs> uh, spells, magic words, things of that sort. There's no continuity in that. I mean, we, we all sort of read how there's witchcraft there and a bit later and things like this, but it does seem to come and go in waves, you know, die and things like this. You know. And very much it's in the eye of the person who's complaining about it rather than in terms of the practitioner. And certainly those people who imagine the Morris and, you know, dancing windershins and things like this, you know, has any continuity of the past, uh, just don't understand history. You know, it's wishful thinking, and we've got to keep away from wishful thinking. But yes, there were pagan, uh, pagan things, um, and over the centuries, they've, the church and for that matter, the governments had to fight against manifestations of this. And yet, you see, what one's complaining about the non-Christian attitude, in the Middle Ages, the church itself encouraged just the same attitudes. You know, the idolatry of, of uh, the Virgin Mother, um, the high, whole idea of saints, the whole idea of having sung masses for your soul, you know, um, 
the idea of relics and all those sort of things which may or may not have had any effectiveness at all, but they're all the same sort of principle. Do you understand? There are two forms of magic. There's the, the sort of similarity. Because something's like something else, it must be it. It must be connected. Right? Um, there were, what do we have? Oh, like Morris dancing, that's right, you know, somebody sees Morris, he Morris, must know everybody else, you know, uh, and they must know all what they do, you know, oh, I met somebody 500 miles away, or I met somebody in New Zealand, do you know them? <laughs> you know, I've had that sort of thing. No, that's the similarity side of it. And the other thing is the contact, the contagion side of it, because something's had contact with it sometime, somehow some link maintained, which is why if you cut your fingernails, you actually get rid of them yourself because somebody will collect them and burn them and it'd be a horrible pain in your fingers and so on. So the theory goes. Um, and those two things. And because, in fact, they're scientifically ridiculous, you know, uh, you have, it discredits the whole attitude. If there is something out there, um, you know, there is no proof. There's only belief. You can say that about all religious faiths anyway. Right? But still, I'm drifting away from this point, you know, paganism. What is pagan about what we do? Well, it's not that it's pagan, it's that what we do has a very long history. Go back a long way. Morris is a form of sport. You know? Sport doesn't mean competitive sport as it is today. That's a late Victorian idea about sport. A uh, point of information, sir, to support this, when Kemp's men applied to the local uh, oh. arts uh, council um, for a grant, they were told, no, um, it's a sport. You better apply to the sports oh. council. Mm -hmm. That's true. But in the past, you think of the word sport, he's a good sport. You know, yes. we did sport and play. It doesn't mean we actually played football. You know, it meant you had a good fun, you entertained yourself, you and things yourself. like this. You know, the word sport had a much wider connotation before the mid-Victorian period. See, so Morris is a sport, it's an entertainment, it's a non-competitive sport, but there are a lot of other sports, you know, activities which are non-competitive. Well, I can't think of any at the moment, but, um, but they all say they were anyhow, as things of that sort. So we're looking back for an origin of sport. Why do people partake in sport, you know, what is it, what is it about it, what's magical, why do crowds get terribly excited at football matches, it isn't for the quality of the football, bloodlust, <laughs> no, it's, the reason I think people go to sport, there is a, a ritual element about it, there is a sort of use of energy that is struggling to do your best, you know, it's like throwing a javelin, you see, you don't actually throw a javelin because it's rather fun to throw it, like throwing a boomerang, you get people throw it just to throw it as far as they can. You, know, you stand at the seashore with stones, you throw it as far as you can. There's a, a competitiveness sort of with yourself, as it were, that goes into it. So going back, what the anthropologists have said is that you go back to the hunter-gatherer um, form of society, which 10,000 years ago in this country couldn't be any older because we were covered by an ice sheet before that. Yeah, you know, there really was no people. Right? But what do hunters? What did hunters do? Right? The first thing they did is they arranged that they didn't smell when they went hunting, so they washed. They would anoint the oil the body or cover the body with dust. They put on clean clothes. We all do that. You know, I mean, it always puzzled me a bit, Morris dancing, you know, you work out great sweat, so why do you have to have a bath beforehand? You see, it's a ritual. It's not due to the fact we're going out hunting for deer, you know, it's, it's sometime in the past people did things and they liked doing it, and as societies changed, they kept these old habits, as it were, and applied them in new situations, which is why it's dangerous to trace back things you say, a thing we do today, like good luck visiting, is like it was thousands of years ago. Because it's true, but you're claiming continuity isn't there. You know, we don't actually have that sort of direct linkage. It's just that something people used to do has been adapted to another purpose, been adapted to another purpose, and so on. So as we are doing with the Morris today, <coughs> there's no way the Morris that we're doing is the, like the 19th century Morris. We don't dress the same. You don't have the same music, musician, you know, type of instrument, 
you don't probably have the same steps, you don't have the same audience, you don't have the same need to do it, and so on and so on. But the only thing we have in common with the past is we call it Morris. You know, uh, yeah, we go around and dance for people, we give them a, a good feeling, this magical lift and things like that we have in common, but we don't actually talk about that to other people, do we? You know, we don't actually sell the Morris to the people um, who employ us or, or watch us and so on. There's something magical for them, something that gives them an uplift. I mean, we talked about this last year, you know, that um, I think the fact that we get Morris gets invited to weddings or they're always welcome to dance around the wards of the hospital. When I think about it, getting a bunch of maniacal people jumping around in a hospital amongst patients who are on death's door who feel like they're on death's door, yeah, yeah, it's sort of uh, somehow uh, a bit illogical. And yet, whenever you do it, the staff of the hospital phone you up later on and say, Thank you so much for coming. I've been talking about it for days afterwards. It's been great. <laughs> Exciting. <Exactly. laughs> That's right, yes. It's no, it's better than more or less when many of the treatments are offered with a straight face on them. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and there's, as, a, as a school of um, thought in the United States, in which uh, they think that laughter is vastly important, and a number of the doctors actually dress as clowns and go around the wards and just gag around with the patients. And these people who have got sort of bits of their body cut off are sitting there bursting their stitches with mirth, and they reckon that they recover much faster because of it. Quite a lot of young doctors are clowns. Well, you know very well that laughter's infectious. You, know, you only have somebody who laughs in the, in the crowd like this, you know, and everybody picks it up, whether it's um, a discussion like this or whether, in fact, you're in a stage show. Mm. Yeah, laughter is infectious. You know, the, the sort of laughing policeman sort of model in a box, you know, yeah. the suicide thing like you know, it's very difficult not to laugh. The song, The Laughing Policeman, if you've got someone who can simulate laughter while they're producing that, it's a really naff song, but lots and lots of people laugh at it. It's so ridiculous, isn't it? Yeah. Back to your point about sort of cleansing um, prior to going out hunting, that would account for teenagers spending a long time in the bathroom before they go. And do you think if we were to market spray on dust in the same an aerosol, <laughs> that would aid the hunting process on Saturday nights? Well, <laughs> the use of makeup powders and things of that sort, you know, which is now done for aesthetic reasons rather than any ritual reasons, as you know, when you talk to anybody about it, yeah. is in fact the same route, yeah. But it's been adapted to a new situation. Now, other sort of things which I, you know, about it. The Greeks, for example, classical people, so we know something about them, because they wrote up what they all did, and things like this. But they, <coughs> would, they would wear um, basically what we would call streamers, ribbons, bows, and things like this, they'd be awarded to people who did well, either well in the hunt or well in the athletics. You know, they actually tied <coughs> big bows round their arms, or round their head, or round their hat, and so on, as a reward. So it became common in the classical <coughs> world that in fact that somebody who was wearing ribbons and things like this was obviously better than average, you know, had done something to get this reward. And one could well expect that the reason that people from the Middle Ages, Tudor and so on, wore ribbons and so on, was in fact it's the same sort of feeling, you know, that somehow or other that showed you were cut above people, it, you know, it was also, a reward. It was also part of um, an ostentatious display of your wealth, because the cost of producing cloth meant that clothing was yeah. horrendously expensive. Most people's clothing <coughs> was cast-offs from Wealthier folks. Yeah. Most poor people lived in um, little better than that. That's why the, the cost of raising a Morris team um, up to certainly 1800 was actually several weeks' wages mm. for a working man. And in fact, those that, where there is any evidence at all, um, the costume was dependent on patronage. Mm. People actually needed to be given the money, as it were. And most, of course, of the late 19th century sides like Ilmington. Buckler and so on, when they got revived, they actually had, in effect, a subsidy for their kit from somebody to actually be, get together with people. <coughs> and it's why at Bampton, and why so much of the kit is developed, <coughs> is passed down through the generations. Because in the days when a Dutch bell for your bell pad was sixpence, mm. and they had 13 <coughs> on the bell pad, and you were paid 15 shillings a week, the 
as a, you know, an adult labourer, in fact, uh, it was actually several weeks' wages that you were looking for. In <coughs> fact, most people never actually bought a new set of bells. You know, you had to get them from where you could. And there's that cost side of it which we tend to forget. It isn't a problem from today. It was a problem <coughs> with kit in the days when everything about them, from the material that you grew, you know, whether it was linen or wool and so on, all processes were hand done. So the cost of a <coughs> suit, like at the back end, like in 1700, was the same as the cost of a suite of furniture. You know, that's, you know, chairs, tables, and things because it was dominated by the man hours that went into it, not the material cost. You know, now it's cotton and machine manufactured made clothing cheap. You know, they really still are <coughs> price, you know, a suite. You know. Could you imagine they paying a thousand pounds for a modest suit, not an expensive one? I thought, which is what we'd be talking about in comparative terms. And that was such a, so important, <coughs> even within our own times. Some of us can remember a multiple store called 50 shilling tailor. They were advertising the fact that... Mm, there was 30 shilling tailors before the war. Mm. <laughs> well, I can't remember that time. Yeah. Oh, that's right, you know. And <coughs> very often the people who, as it were, shoot off their mouth about the thing, how they feel about things, don't have a knowledge of historical facts mm. to get these things into proportion. As I say, you know, I, I personally believe that of the many threads that make the Morris, one of them is the, is it really, ancient idea of sport, which itself traces itself back to prehistoric behaviour. You know, but I so say the linkage is not a continuous one. We don't do it for the same reason can anymore. We, can we return to the, the pagan thing, which is constantly brought up, an attempt to link the Morris with um, pagan activity? Um, the Morris, because it's a sport thing, and because it is not controlled by the establishment, has always been not very respectable. And various attempts have been made to suppress it. There are <coughs> various stories about why sides fell into... You, you clearly system. haven't read the sort of Healy um, forest paper of the early Morris animals, because, in fact, it, the... The Morris, as we know it, started at the court with the guilds. It was actually highly respectable. A lot of money was invested yeah, in it. In the 19th century? Yeah, but because for some reason or other, the church turned against it. Mm. You know, and it then drifted away from the public function, that's a civic function, mm. into private patronage. Mm. Right? And then come the 19th century, the, the private patronage, that's the gentry you visit in the United States, that stopped or dropped away because they didn't, you know, they had an improving society. And it was anything which was just fun, particularly associated with a bit of drinking and so on, you know, was framed on. You weren't improving yourself. Uh, you only have to read, was it Hudson's book on May, May Day in uh, Cotswolds or in Oxfordshire? Where he charts through the changes in society, the sports clubs, the, um, uh, sort of allotment societies, the flower shows, and all the other things which were thought to be a more productive use of people's time. Not necessarily what the people involved thought was a good use of their time, you know, but that was the sort of basic attitude, yes. Um, and all sorts of stories grew about the Morris. You only have the one Morris team that gets drunk and into trouble, and that labels all Morris sides. But it's true of kids who ride motorcycles, dress up in leather, you only have one to cause trouble. One black face causing trouble, and all blacks are a nuisance yeah, type of argument. One of the ways of attempting to discredit any group is to associate them with other undesirable groups. Um, what I'm suggesting is that when the Morris, towards the end of the 19th century, was regarded as not very respectable, uh, and you've retailed a story about um, one, one of the... Uh, Cotswold villages lost its side. There was a an event that was hushed up, a fight in which someone was killed, and you, no, you, action, no action was taken because uh, they agreed to disband the side. Yeah, now that bit of folklore exists in at least 20 places in the Cotswold, mm. and no amount of searching records has substantiated it ever. 
the Morris stopped, the and they, the explanation they gave for stopping the Morris is usually that some, you know, there was some incident where somebody got killed and it was all hushed up. Mm. And that actually was not the explanation, it was the other way around. They were finding an explanation of why the Morris had stopped, not the Morris had stopped because of their explanation. But someone was happy to hang um, on the Morris an undesirable label. These people get involved in murder. They are, you know, it's a good thing that the Morris no longer exists. I think this one, one thing that I think being selected with with the late 19th century and Morris dancing being a bad thing in certainly vast parts of the country it was being encouraged mm. as being a good thing because well, it kept people out of the pubs because they were then taking part in I mean, there was a sort of resurgence of civic sponsorship. As far as, as far as we know, in the northwest, in the border, and in Eastern Anglia, the peak of the you know, the Morris was the back end of the 19th century, not like it was for the 100 years earlier with the Cotswold Morris. Mm. These, most of our traditions have no great origin, you know, no great historical depth. You know? There's no reason why they should. You know, they're associated, like in Lancashire, with in fact people having the wherewithal to dress themselves up or their kids up and get it on the street and actually having transport to get to places and the start of the wakes, the start of the rose festivals. If you read Tess Buckland's articles about um, Nutsford, you know, and how the first club side, you know, appeared at Nutsford in the 1860s, as it were, and the whole growth of the thing. This is, none of that was considered undesirable. All the, the rush cart and the pulling of the rush cart by drunken men and things like this was heavily framed upon. And women getting involved in things and getting drunk was heavily framed upon it. You don't really well. When I was young, women didn't go into public bars. Mm. Yeah? Now you can't find a public bar in any pub. <laughs> you know, it isn't like that anymore. Well, you hardly do a real public bar in the old way. I mean, how many years since you've seen sawdust down on the floor? You know, people don't spit in pubs anymore. Thank Christ for that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. so some things do change for the better. We're always in a danger, I think, of actually being selective about past history. You know, like saying... It's a historian's the Mor game, though, isn't it? If you're no, a no, no. You say the Morris had a bit of a bad reputation, but a lot of other things did as well. Mm. Yeah. Weren't considered good for people or healthy for people. That's yeah, but, but if we're not considering those. If the Morris had a bad reputation, one of the ways of discrediting it would be to associate it with other things that were undesirable, unchristian. Pagan, and I think uh, the pagan thing. Well, I I don't actually, in my reading, find before 1850 the use of pagan or ritual in association with the Morris. Right, which tends to the revival invented these words. You know, we actually were copying, as it were, what the collectors wanted to ourselves. believe, and when they're being hung by their words, in my opinion. Mm. Roy, yeah, so the great thing about the early Morris annuals, there is uh, to some extent, uh, not a single mention of mm -hmm. ritual, seasonal, where there's a mention of sex half the time, there were mixed sets, and so on. No, no mention of black faces, only one mention of the use of sticks. You know, it was a different world. <laughs> Roy, what do you, I, you, you briefly mentioned Georgina Boy's book, Imagine the Village, yesterday. Yes. Um, about, I don't know if everyone's come across this, it's a, a history of the folk bar, but it's actually not too heavy a read for an academic tome, it's certainly worth getting hold of and having a read. Only cost 35 No, it's paid back. She, but, she, but, she is biased. Yes. You know, I would say, what do you think of, of You have to tone, when you read it, you have to tone it down a bit in your mind as you go through. But she's perfectly correct in saying <coughs> that the collectors had an attitude which we wouldn't have today. That, for example, Sharp and so on actually believe they owned what they collected and they knew what they were collecting, so they only were very select in what they did. And for their time, they were actually right. They did what they did in good faith. And that's what she won't allow. That the people actually at that time, she tends to blacken them and say they were actually doing all this deliberately. Uh, and I don't think it's no deliberately in final politics start showing through. Yeah. Now you don't under, you have to again read to understand how much the Fraser's book 
you know, the Golden Bow and all the attitude that went in that. The idea of Merry England. Uh, Roy Judge has written about Mary England recently and the whole idea about Mary England and the suggestion that at one time there was just the one Morris dance. You know, some people in the 19th century were looking at origins could only find Staines Morris, the tune, yeah, the Morris tune. So there was one dance. And it's not a silly idea. You know, the Morris may well have just been, there was something recognised as the Morris. It's not something which <coughs> appeals to me. Right. Do so I say, I keep, do, keep coming up. Do we, do we assume that everyone in this room doesn't believe that it's paid? Mm -hmm. Do we assume that everyone agrees that there's lots of things being said that they just don't agree with? What's anybody in the room going to do with it? When, when, when is somebody going to stand up and tell everybody that all this it being paid is not true. The Cotswolds, as a, as a term for the Morris that we do, mainly is not true. The religious, it devalues the fact that the, there are families yep. doing the Morris rather than being associated with the place, because more associated with the families. Well. What's anybody going to do with it? Well, we can talk about it until the cares come in. But are we really doing anything about it? What could be done? Well, that's what I mean. Well, one thing that's being done about it is you can actually go and read about it. Yeah, you know. How are we going to persuade people that all this story that's going to be is total absolute fabrication? Who are you trying to persuade? Because I think there's a fair amount of persuasion or attempted persuasion for those who are, who are prepared to listen, who are against this. There are a fair few who aren't prepared to listen. The problem is, well, nothing's being done here. Where, where does the story go round? Does it go round further than the folk world? Yes. Morris sides stand yes. up in public and actually talk and about fertility yes. rights yes. Yeah, yeah, and the yeah. pagan and origin of what they do. But you read a newspaper report and it mentions the pagan origins. Full stop yeah. every time. Yeah. Even North West Morris does it. My sister is very upset with my brother and I see those Morris dance and she's very religious and she thinks it's, it's very bad and my children also being told to try and persuade me to give up Morris dancing because it's not a Christian thing to do. That's because of the great um, yeah. pagan advertising drive, isn't it? Make yeah. Wicker but work. the crazy <laughs> thing about it is that the origins of Morris dancing, certainly in England, grew out of the guilds and their religious celebration at the back end of the Middle Ages. Mm. You know, when the monasteries were dissolved and a lot of these you know, Catholic um, observances were, were killed, as it were, the urge to dance, well, to process in dance and celebrate became um, the patrons move. The, yeah, the matrons move. So in fact, it, it then become uh, part of the civic ceremony rather than the religious ceremony. Mm. And we all think of guilds as being designed to promote trade or promote a um, restriction of trade. Well, no, it was actually like to control, control. Uh, a particular. Plans process or something like this. The fact is the guilds weren't. The guilds of primary objective was religious observance. Yeah. And the people who grouped together happened to come from a certain trade or occupation in some sort of way and as it were incidentally controlled it. But not very much. The London guilds were much more guilty of the control, but the guilds and the villages were usually concerned with regular processions or getting masses said provision of candles, and so on and so on. It is all incredibly well documented since 1700. The first man to write about that, you know, was a long time ago. In a great, as far as I'm concerned, that's as Christian as anything else we do. I don't find people moaning about Christmas, you know, and all the way we celebrate. I mean, people do moan about it, you know, and so on, basically saying how unchristian it all is. And so I don't know what they imagine it you know, it ought to be like. I mean, under the Puritans, in fact, Parliament used to meet on Christmas Day, which wouldn't be a bad idea. Yeah, make the brothers work, I said. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> we'll get paid enough. Yeah. yeah. But what we have to do is somehow get the message over to people that irresponsible claims harm the rest of us. You know, I don't really care if a sider goes actually thinks that it's got pagan origins, that's practicing fertility right, 
go around saying they do it as long as the tar is only on them. If they get away with it, great. If in fact people are that upset with it, you know, and it only affects them, that would be great as well. But it isn't like that. Every Morris side's behaviour affects every other Morris side, really. Which is why I keep saying, you know, we have a responsibility to the past, present and future of the Morris. You know, you can't actually foul your own nest, really. What, May Day? No. Public holidays like May Day occurred because that was the slack time of the agricultural year. If people who actually have to work hard to subsist as economy have a slack time, that's when they used to have the time off. It happens to coincide with May Day, or about that time of the year. In the same way as the quarter days of March the 21st. You know. There are good reasons why all these things happen. But I mean, when did the idea of dancing the sun up on the 1st of May come from? Dancing when? Dancing the sun up, dancing at dawn on the 1st of May. Mm. I can't think of it more other than um, dancing at Maldon Bridge by in Oxford, you know, on May morning. I can't think of anybody who actually did that 20 years ago. That it certainly happened in my lifetime. That particular period of the year is very important because it's the time when most people died of starvation. It was called in the Middle Ages the Hungry Gap. It's the yeah. time when... Starving ones. Yes. Your supplies of food have run out, the food that you've stored is rotting, and you haven't yet got any crops from anything. Only the dairy produce are coming. Right. And you've gone through Lent, which is um, a formalisation of the fact that you're short of food. Yeah. And you're entering the period when you're hoping things are going to get better. And it's a very important symbol, and it's a symbol of belief in the future. No, it's the time of the year when you actually start to get the cows and the lambs, and the shoots are growing up and things like that. You actually know whether you're actually going to be successful. It's a thanksgiving. You're going to say, thank God we're actually going to have a summer and a, cro you know, a crop. But you're I'm still quite sure we wouldn't turn it on May Day to celebrate when they knew they were going to have a bad year. People would be far too busy doing something about it. There wouldn't be a slack time in the agricultural year. There's what you can do about that time. If you planted seed, that's what you're saying. Well, you get a second cropping of something or other. Normally, when every, everything's wave. germinated, everything's growing, and it's May is the period before you start cutting hay. Right? Back end of May, you start cutting hay. Now, another thing that's proper about May, of course, is the calendar changes. The fact that not only did we change the calendar in the 18th century by 13 days, it was hilarious, but the calendar was already a week or so out of uh, kilt before, mm. in the period when a lot of these festivals were, were running. You know, and that's um, why, I mean, this is one of the reasons why wheat is such an important <coughs> holiday in England, of course, is because it really is the slack, the slack time. We, we, we usually it was the slack time with the train as well. Yeah. We, usually, we usually get reasonable weather around yeah. wheat, um, you've got a bit of time. That's why so many of the what we think of as calendar customs are linked right. to it. I'll ask you a very personal question. In the Mediterranean, um, the great fertility celebrations were before Lent. Fashing, the carnival, is before Lent, right? Where traditionally couples went out into the woods and into the countryside to have a good time. <coughs> have you ever tried it in this country? <laughs> <or in February? laughs> I have slept out of doors early. That wasn't I don't get the question I had in mind. Not with anyone. Well, being with that. something it might have been warmer. But I can assure you from personal experience it has a minimum of something. appeal. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes, I, I, I got hypothermia to it. <laughs> yes. How many people yeah. here are on routines that dance at dawn on the 1st of May? We're in North West too, that's really traditional. Nice. <laughs> it is pathetic. Well, it, it is interesting, I mean, you know, I do. I really enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've no idea. I like something twisted out of the year. Yeah. 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 But for a very long time, people were quite happy not to do it. Well, for a very long time, they had it 
Lots of yeah, but you see, when you get up on a particular day every year at a particular time to go to a particular place, well, actually, like some of our local sites down in the hills and my part of the world, you know, it becomes an annual event. <laughs> Things you do the same thing every year become special anyway. And the Morris world tends to forget that. It's the same as us probably doing a 14 mile. Yeah, every year. One year, one one day every year. Yeah. It, or there's an achievement going about down it. the circle every yeah. year. Most of it's an achievement yeah. to get up at dawn. Yeah. Mm. The other thing is it also adds to that specialness. You turn up at work, and we got was one one of the other another member of the team works the same place as I do, and she is renowned for being the last one into the office and not actually communicating until ten o'clock. May morning she comes bouncing in having been up for sort of four hours or three hours, having had a wonderful breakfast, really feeling good, and the rest of the company just can't cope on it. She's difficult to cope when she's a full bounce anyway, but people can't cope with it first thing in the morning. And okay, yes, they think we're mad. Those of them that haven't, those of us, those that haven't done it think we're mad, but it's a sort of madness that they know they couldn't, or they think they couldn't emulate. The one interesting point about that was that one of the other chaps said, oh, I do wish you'd told me, because when he was at university, St. Andrews, people used to get up on May morning, wearing their sort of academic garb, and go and watch the sunrise over the sea, and some of the more hardy ones would go and have a swim. But it's the same thing, are they? They're not worried, nothing to do with mm -hmm. Morris dancing at all. But he but said that the getting up the once a year was really something... But we all know of people who go for... Cup final tickets, Henley, last night of the proms, you know, Sidmouth on the front. Yeah. Well, why do we all get things that happen every year? On May the first. Why May the first? Yeah. Well, because there was a May the first. Yeah. I mean, it, it's an interesting experience to go and dance on May in May morning in Oxford, but um, I don't think traditionally undergraduates should just throw themselves off the bridge, but actually come the tradition is. Yeah. The, the, the Welsh Folk Museum published a book about Welsh customs, describing how certain customs, like bringing in the May on May Day, spread into Wales within recorded memory. So some of these ancient customs are not as ancient as you'd like to believe. Um, Prue Foswell has got a wonderful quote about that with the North West Morris when she was doing a lot of research in local newspapers and things. And she says, if you ever find a record in a local newspaper of the 1880s and 1890s describing something as the ancient and traditional Morris dance, you know it is less than five years old yes. in that particular location. She's never ever found an exception to that. Yeah. That's the way it was described. I was surprised by some reactions minutes ago, the suggestion of getting up at dawn, it being something outrageous. But it's no more outrageous than people camping overnight outside a shop that's going to have a sale. That really is seriously weird. Stupid, yeah. If you want to buy something. If you live in the Age of Hebrides, which is near the Arctic Circle, you do have a problem about dawn for great chunks of the year. <laughs> you know? Or in midsummer, you don't have a sunset, you know. Um, it depends where you live, in that sort of sense. You're quite right, May, you know, it turns out that about the early May in our present calendar, it's quite a pleasant time to turn up, it's not too early, it's early enough, you know. Uh, it doesn't interfere with the rest of your life very, very much, and so on, the weather's always good, you know, never hardly ever rains on May Day. I was driving rain, I could barely see where I was going. <laughs> what am I doing this? But we got there and we stood up on the hill and it was pouring with rain and we were all standing there around umbrellas and as we started to dance, it stopped raining and the sun came up. Oh, well, 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 well there. Yeah. Well, yeah. I've, I've, I've never known it rain at dawn and, and we've it had rotten May days and it gets later. But no, I don't mind really nice time of the day. Yeah. I've known it rain at dawn, and the problem was that was the year we had the very uncommunicative French person's day. Uh, we well. got him up, he was staying with, I was in two teams at the time, he was actually staying with the other team. But because we had both been in the house, we got him up at half past four, half past four, we drove him to the university, we went up on the roof, and he stood there in the rain in the middle of the night. 
because it was pitch black because it was raining so hard and we danced. And the musicians had to stay in the under shelf right. that wet. And then we all went home and we went back to bed again because it was a bloody awful morning. So if well, you can do I could check the date if anyone's really fussy. We do have a problem coming back to this calendar, we do have a problem with the slow drift of the calendar over the years. And one of the problems that we now have with May Day is too early for the plants. You know, before they change the calendar, May and a lot of other things were in blossom. You know, May the first is no longer true. You know? No, but it is about the time. I, I mean, I've noticed it is about the time that our trees are fully in leaf. The mm. first, it's about that time that our trees are fully. My in My part of the world, it's not true. Well, it isn't. Well, it, is in, it is in Bristol. It is in Mm. We get we get cuckoos on my morning. That's neither here nor there, though. I mean, we choose a day because it's supposedly got some significance. But actually, the very fact that you get up and do this silly thing is what makes it special to us yeah. um, and special to the people who come and watch. And there are some few idiots yeah. that come and watch. There's no doubt. If you go up on Midsummer's Day, it would be extremely early. <laughs> <laughs> we do have a local team that do it. What Midsummer's Day? Well, I think the answer to Tim is in the sense that um, we, being a democratic organisation, the Morris Sides, as it were, where the, the Sides' autonomy is terribly important to the rest of us who want the autonomy, that if the Sides are going around actually preaching these silly things, which I, I think is silly things, you know, there really aren't much you can do with it. You can stand up and say your bit. You know, but it's like going on against the Conservative Party. It won't win us the next election, <laughs> whichever side I'm on. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. You can't can't get away from people being people in that sort of sense. But I, you know, I get more and more offended over the, the people who actually have, to some reason or other, they have to claim ancient origins for things. There's nothing else I know of in this world. It actually goes around saying we date back to Saxon times or pagan times and so on. Is it a bit of embarrassment? Is it a bit of a case of we can't actually. Yeah. Cricket? Saxon times? Kidding. Cricket and the way that there's quite a lot of things. Yeah, well, the Royal Antediluvian Order of Buffaloes. <laughs> Which is set up with uh, the <laughs> It's quite a lot of writers of uh, alternative phenomena <laughs> books who will claim that things the, the, the myth, the myth is back to the book. And the people have just ignored the view. That's the They're serious crackpots in my opinion. They probably regard me much the same way. But I mean, you know, to, they, give, they, they to give themselves really respectability, they claim a very long history. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. What they're doing is um, it, it, it's a, a technique which is used by politicians, it's been used by self publicists throughout the whole of human history. If you don't like the opposition, I was trying to say earlier, people who didn't like the Morris said it was pagan. They tried to tar it with, uh, by associating it with something that was undesirable. And people who are uh, promoting the, an idea of their own uh, say, well, it must be good because it's been around for at least a 100,000 years or whatever it is that they claim. Uh, uh, it sounds murder and adultery. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. What's wrong? It's a, <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit like an organic product. I can, I can provide you with strychnine, which is 100% organic. That's not, not bloody good, is it? Yes. Well, I think part of it is a, <laughs> a case of, and I, certainly I think... Totally organic. The early revival, it was a case of, this is a vaguely stupid thing we're doing. We happen to enjoy it. We happen to get a lot out of it. But we don't think that that is going to convince you, the audience, that it's not stupid. And you'll, you'll make fun of us. So, in order to get over that, we'll paint ourselves this mythical, we'll believe this mythical history and, and hand that round as the real reason we're doing it. We're doing it because it's traditional, we're doing it because it goes back to pagan times or whatever. We're actually, we're doing it because it does something for us now. But I, I, I thought the whole it. thing about the collectors, uh, uh, if they had a, a hidden agenda at all, or 86P, if, was that 
they were actively looking to, to find something that they believed existed. And that thing they believed existed was a link with the past um, in order to provide a, a, a national characteristic which was in keeping with the fact that we were the biggest bloody empire on the planet. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was the whole, half the point of going around collecting these things was, was to back up this feeling that, good God, you know, we've been around, we're, we're top nation, bigger, we're top nation. Yeah. we must have a history here, let's find it. Now, I, I mean, I'm prepared to agree that the individuals did not have that specific political agenda, but that may well have been the atmosphere in which they operated. Yeah, but unfortunately, Sharp only had Fraser, etc., and a few other yeah. references to go by. And he used that as they were they were the recognised um, yeah, people at the time who used that. And then and then and then that was picked up by people like Gardner who said the priestly art of Morris and all that to me. He had some wonderful things to say about some things, but some absolutely awful things to say. And that's been picked up by the Morris Ring. And for since nineteen thirty from nineteen thirty two to the to the sixties, their view prevailed. And that view has tarnished everything that's happened since. I was going to ask about Gardner, actually, Roy. Oh, yeah. But that was the view. It's interesting in Georgina's book that he goes from this looking for um, a very English, you know, an English folk history <coughs> to almost to match the artistic folk histories that people like Bartok mm. were producing for their countries. <coughs> and then when you get, when Georgina's book gets to Gardner, you suddenly get the Golden Bow stuff, the, the paganism, the yes. mystical priesthood all coming thundering in. Now, knowing very little about that piece of history, not having the time or energy to go through all the references she's provided, you know, do you know, or well, what's your opinion on my that? Con my contact with Rolf Gardner before he died, uh, over two or three years, is such I cannot recognise her description of Gardner with the person I knew, his writings, which he showed me at great length, or his magazine, North Sea and Baltic, where he expressed his views. And certainly some of the fascist references and so on, uh, the way he described it to me, these people were not recognised as fascists to start with. No, Kibbo Kift and things like this were not seen at. When they broke away and became the green shirts and things like this, he disowned them as well as anybody. You only have to read the 20s and 30s editions of his occasional magazine to get his views. At great length, he was a great man for talking and a great man for writing. He you know, made it quite clear with his view. The fact that he ran a work camp each year at harvest time where he invited professional people down from London, like doctors and mechanics and so on, who'd work on the lands because they believe it's part of them establishing their roots again. We can't criticise that. Because we're not them. We don't know what these people were getting out of it. But what I do know is that one evening during a work camp, they actually organised a performance of Aida at the mill. I was invited along to come and enjoy it. And the people there, they were the singers and the orchestra. They had no audience. It was just this rows of seats and all these instruments were laid out. And if you weren't actually singing, you were playing. And I had this crane that lowered the people on this cloud across the pond and things like this, you know. It was dreadfully upper middle class or more, you know, in a sort of attitude and the way it was all done. But it was done with such spirit, you know, such a way that I thoroughly enjoyed it, you know, and I very much respect them. But they weren't folk, no. you know. He wasn't. I mean, his uncle who bought Gore Farm for him and sort of got him going, Balfour Gardner, you know, was relatively rich, was a composer, very artistic in the classical model. You know, and again, when you listen to his production in night, yes, he was a he was a good man, a great man in this sort of field. But, you know, I I find that I find nothing sort of fashion. Oh he had extreme views, you know. The idea that the EFGS should have converted itself to the English folk dance society to the English festival dance society and she set up all around the country festivals where the best traditional performers in song and dance and song were actually invited to perform to the general public and so on. He wrote that in 1922, and it was 50 years before the first one happened. You know, now the countryside's full of the bloody things. You see, he was a visionary, that's all. 
he didn't, didn't have the sense to actually be practical in the sense of saying, um, it can't be done now. You know, he just stood up and proclaimed it should be done. It's, it's difficult to equate that sort of view with, uh, with fascism, because although, it, although that has been used by totalitarian states, Right. They've all attempted to um, make themselves more attractive to the general population by presenting folk culture as being something of extreme value. Well, I mean, Eastern European countries. Well, that's to see how you know, the, the, you know, Hitler, in fact, emphasised the folk culture in Germany as a way of pulling the people together. But, we all forget that in 1817 there was no united Germany. You know, um, Bismarck reduced another German states from 2,500 to 250. You know, um, it took the First World War before they become conscious themselves as Germans all over. And the stupidity of the sales and the idea of you know, ethnic separation uh, meant that when Hitler started saying, I want Austria, I want Sudetenland, I want a bit of Poland and so on, actually people thought it was quite reasonable because he just wanted the Germans back again. Then he said there were three million Germans in Ukraine, which is true, or was true, and so on. No, they got a sympathy that because that was the mood of the time. We now know it's wrong. You know, the Balkans, you know, is a bloody good example when you've got mixed people they only had peace when they were either run by the Turks, who had nothing to do with them, or the Austrian Empire. Or a very, very <coughs> hard. It's General Tito. Yes, you said the Tito. Oh, the bad heads. The communists, another eight sign imposed idea. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, what I was saying is that, is that the idea of using folk culture as a unifying element is not the right bit right here, because it also occurs in Union. But the folk culture is, in fact, by its very nature, localised. Mm. Yeah, we said last night, Cotswolds, well, isn't even the Cotswolds. Because when Stowe reigned at Bath, which is in the Cotswolds, there's no record of Morris at all. Really, you know. And the bit, the other side of Stowe, or the other side of Woodstock, isn't in the Cotswolds by geologist standards, anyhow. Yeah, Whose fault's that one? It's a very interesting uh, question, yeah, really. I know <laughs> Keith Chandler yeah. had that problem. He called it the Safe Midlands. You know, yes. you know, we all know the Safe Midlands to the start. That's up north, So that, that would account for Norwich being close off Norris, wouldn't it? Because the ridge runs all the way over there. It, it does, if you yeah. trace yeah. it through. Yeah. The Cotswolds are there. They're just about 300 feet below sea level. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but so is most of North East. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it wasn't called Cotswold Morris. No. no. But then it was James Morris, or all Richard Arthur Morris. Morris, yeah. Morris does. Now, we call it Cox and Morris and distinguish it between the other. Yeah. You know, but then we call East Anglia Morris Molly, which means nothing to anybody. <laughs> Just means Morris. Right. Uh, we call Border Morris Border, and yet you go to Worcestershire or Herefordshire, and they, the locals are scandalised at the thought they're in the border of anything. Well, Worcestershire isn't. Well, all the three border counties, one of them doesn't have a border with Wales. Yeah. Any cool clogged on the cloth? That's right. Well, people up north don't like that either, though it's very descriptive. <coughs> yeah. But then you see in the 19th the century, Morris didn't clogs. wear clogs very much. That was the economy working class of wore clogs. Yeah, and it's interesting, we're going back to the, the look at golden aging. It wasn't until Morris dancing was seen as something that was old and had a long history that people started wearing clogs. Yes. God, are, uh, Godly Hill switched to clogs and bridges yeah. and so on quite late in their history. Yeah. yeah. And the first, the first team we know who never wore shoes were Horwich, and they weren't found until um, 1898 or something. 1888 or something like that. 1891, something, something around. There. So that's actually quite late. I mean, that's long after all, just about all the Cotswold Morris has stopped. You yeah. get the first team who only ever wore clogs. But you see, jumping to conclusions and getting you know wrong things does no harm in general. In fact, we all go through life like this, mm. grabbing a first thought that comes into our mind, if it seems sensible, or you send it off. But surely it doesn't matter. I mean, it sums up some Cotswold, sums up something, but uh, we all know what it means now. I mean, 
think we should we do, the general public. Not Cotswold, Cotswold. Yeah, well, I don't think it's Cotswold. a problem. No. I mean, you call a French horn. But it's not a problem for the general public. You don't say anything to the general public about that, do you? Yeah. names in there? Well, I mean very general. This, this, Tim said, what can we do about it? One of the things I feel we we ought to do. A lot of people are very interested in Morris on this. It, they 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 come and talk to you and ask questions like, it. where do the dances come from and how old are they? And so, and you often have to be quite honest and say we don't know very much about it. We do it because we enjoy it. But yeah. we also use part of the publicity, um, the announcements, and some of them are very, very spurious, and some of them, um, in the light of what's been said tonight, are possibly damaging. Like, one of the, the gags... Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> one, one of the gags that we use is, uh, is when we start bottling, we say, the Morris is very, very ancient. Some of these dances tonight go back to 1991. And but even older than that is the Lucky Morris hat, which will pass amongst you. Put your money in the Lucky Morris hat. Each donation will give you a guarantee of good luck or fertility for one year. That's very true. I never make any but promises. It's, but, but it's very traditional PAT to do that. I mean, everybody's been people. doing that for centuries about what yeah. they do. When, they, when they're doing street entertainment, they were always made promises like that. Oh, yeah. But the, the know, point there's is nothing wrong with it. There's, there's the as long as you don't take it seriously. No, and it has to be Money done. Debt, it yeah, has please. to be done in a very jovial way so that they don't take it seriously. Mm. You you are being outrageous and cutting them out of money in a happy way. Thanks. Yeah, it is. Yeah, but but we are associating ourselves with good luck, fertility, charms, the things that we were told were not quite right. Um, we do it constantly because it's an easy pattern that we've already developed. Yeah, well, I would suggest the thought that uh, mentioning fertility might have been very acceptable 80 years ago. Mm. <laughs> you know, well, the, the, the way small. people thought yeah, about well, it. Well, this is, this is what we say is the... Uh, now, today, I mean, there are people very worried about overpopulation, resource, mm -hmm. things like this. And most people who aren't particularly fertile are very concerned about it because they actually understand why they're not fertile and what it all means and so on, you know. It actually is a good topic to joke about. Most of the rest of us spend a lot more money trying to stay in fertile. Mm. Yeah, well, we don't. Uh, and one or two people who are spending a lot of money trying to become fertile. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, yeah come on. Yeah. I, I think that's a little bit sensitive, a little bit politically correct. <laughs> and, and we, <laughs> <laughs> we, which, which, is, which has never been part of the Murrays from, from what you say. They've never attempted... Yeah, no, um, and we turn that into a gag in itself, you know, we, we say things like, um, good luck and fertility guaranteed for a 12-month period, you know, written receipts and guarantees available from the bag man, VAT receipts cost you a little extra, uh, the good luck um, cost a little bit more than the fertility, sir, and, you know, we, we make it a part of the gag. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's not really claiming, you see, a pagan origin. No, it's not claiming, it's but it's making anything. an association. Yeah. Oh, yes. It reinforces an association yeah. that the audience yeah. might support. Yes, it does. Right, well, what is it? Um, we've heard a lot about Morris, and the association of pagans, or being accused of association with paganism. What about other European folk, uh, folk dance? Does that just other countries? The trouble with Europe is Cecil Sharp's friends spread everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. there, there actually is, it, no, there are some very good writers in Central Europe, and for that matter in France and Spain, who really take no notice of that sort of origin at all. They just say, it grew eight of, like sword dancing grew out of the uh, mining guilds and things like this, and they've got hard evidence that it did. You know, and the sword dance was taken around Europe by the German engineers. There's hard evidence that it was in some places. It's yeah, also hard yeah, evidence that most of the Christian festivals are a direct adoption of pagan festivals. But it doesn't make them pagan festivals, does it? No. They're no. Christian festivals. It doesn't but make them particularly Kalashari, Christian festivals either. Kalashari is a, They're a just very close associate thing with the Morris in the sense, because it goes around and visits, visits and dances in different places. But Kalashari. If you've ever seen any film of Romanian Kalashari, 
I mean, it is extremely ritualistic. And people bring their babies to be danced over. And people think they can be cured. What country is that from? Romania. Romania. Ru and, in and Romania, the colour is they perform good luck visiting. They go around to people who are ill for one reason or other on the basis that giving somebody a lift up, as it were, does them good. And that's why I keep mentioning, you know, the English Morris visiting hospitals and the sick and so on. It has a positive effect. They have a whole series of little skits that they do, which actually have, you know, when translating to English, you wonder why they do such childish things. But everybody understands what they are, and they have the same objective. They are to, not just to entertain, they are to lift to make people feel better. And in a more primitive culture, i.e. one that hasn't heard of Freud and all the modern science, as it were, these things are effective in the same way as they are in Africa, you know, the, the, the equivalent of a witch doctor, the dressing up and things like that, has an effect. It's not having an effect in this country. Well, one yes. of the problems is yeah. life's full of mysteries, things you can't it? express, <laughs> and you don't have the jargon, well, and sometimes the only way to express it is through <laughs> dance, song, or some other emotive thing. But it doesn't oh. have to be that subtle. The conversation has reminded me of a thing that my mother used to do. I remember on one occasion I was at walking home and a seagull shat on me head. Oh. I think it was intentional. <laughs> but my mother carefully wiped it off and she said, Oh, that's good luck. Yeah. That made me feel a whole lot better. You know? Normally, what would have been a disastrous activity of some oh, animal yeah. defecating on you had been turned into good luck. You know, I was, was going to have a really good week. I was going to. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, it, it was. It's, that way you turn great. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It is in fact special. Grecian 2000 seagull shit I put on my hair. Fucking <laughs> picture. Well, it's like it's like, like things like um, my mother has been known to buy warts off people. Now warts tend to go away actually anyway. So you've got a 50% chance, chance, chance of being affected. I let somebody else and buy some water as well. Yeah. But that's what they say. Because the work hurts, you can't buy your own off. No, no. It's no. Stuck no. With it. But this is about doctors. Doctors, half the patients will get better with regards to what they do. Mm -hmm. And of the other half, half of them are probably cured by what their treatment. Mm. So the doctor sits there curing three quarters of his patients, yeah. for which he only does any good for a quarter of them. Mm. It's a great contract. Yeah. And they're paid well for it. Yeah. <coughs> The consultants pick up the other quarter, quarter, don't they? That's not so. No, uh, the other quarter can be found outside most churches. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, someone's, there's, there's one part, I don't know how many of you are into, into the Terry, some of Terry Pratchett books. There's a lovely thing in there about um, sort of medicine and things. Um, one of them is that most people get better at things that don't kill them. <laughs> yes. Which, if you think about it, is true. I mean, it's, it's like yes. the thing, oh, doctor, I've got a cold. Um, well, you know, actually, the, the real medical thing to say is, well, tough. <laughs> you sort of go home, stay in bed if you feel like getting up, and yeah. eventually you'll get better. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, there isn't any magic. You can't do anything. The body's quite that. efficient at dealing with colds anyway. Um, anyway, yeah. Um, and quite a lot of the time, I mean, the, the, you know, some of my friends have got codes. They, they write telovia on your your notes. And it looks like some Latin word. It means that there's a lot of it about. And it's whatever's going round at the moment. And again, there's nothing you could do. Yeah. If, if, if you're the sort of patient who responds to pills, you give them a fairly harmless antibiotic. If you're the sort of patient who responds to sort of TLC, you tell them to go home. Well, have a good. glass of whiskey tonight. It'll help you sleep. It that was the classic, the classic recipe, wasn't it, for the doctor with somebody that didn't know what was wrong with them. So the, the um, message to the chemist was, take something out of the blue jar in the window and something out of the red jar. <laughs> you know, it's only coloured water, but we're doing my, good. My father was a pharmacist. He once gave a prescription for water to somebody. The doctor's instructions. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with it. Well, look, homeopathic <laughs> medicine, which is in fact you thin it down so much there's no longer any of it there. You know, but the shape of the molecules in the water is probably what you're talking about. You see? Some people would believe in it. Well, really?
<laughs> well, it's quite impressed to actually meet a vet who practiced homeopathic medicine on animals, who hmm. couldn't possibly be persuaded, you know, well, that the yeah. water was going to do them any good. But uh, um, I mean, in our culture, there's a great belief in, in, in what we call medicine. That it's going to do us some good. <coughs> nah. I mean, there's a good <laughs> lot of scientific theory behind it. Right. Right. Yeah, several pints last night. Um, basically, no, not a lot. A leaf. <laughs> all right, You're so that, we've, we've all agreed that it's all sanely based on good pagan roots. Right? <laughs> yeah. That dates back to the origins of the human race itself. Yes. This is, of course, medicine. Enjoy. Boris dancing was all invented last week. Yes. Enjoyment and I, dancing whatever. Oh, I, I was absent on part of this. And that's what they mean. Yeah. You know, but it's not fact, enjoying in yourself is pre-Puritan. Jurassic. I was absent from part this, of the This suit part disappeared now. Yeah. 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 He was only asking where the suit was. Yeah. 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 I was going to say, I was absent from part of the discussion. I mean, I don't know whether any you didn't point. You know, I mean, cause <laughs> there's all this stuff about you shouldn't say that it's, um, that it's sort of from pagan origins, it's fertility. But actually, the punters like that. Yeah, they, they, do. Do. Yeah. they do like it. I mean, what do you, how do you deal with that? Origin. I mean, I don't like to disabuse them, actually. So I actually usually play it up a bit. And, and if Just you, a little if you bit. Start I mean, I say, well, we don't know, but... But it's only because of the 16th century dancers and we've dispersed Yeah, but they already know it. It's there. Oh, it's it's right. waiting around. They just want you to confirm it. They get quite upset, actually. They get quite upset, actually. They get quite upset, if you don't well, confirm it, though. I don't know. I mean, it's it's true. We are getting into politics. The truth. But if you don't confirm it, you've got to get into lengthy discussions, haven't you? And you haven't got time for that, usually. Yes, you have. Oh, you're not going to have a sound bite, Jethro. Yeah. <laughs> you can use the wicker work. Okay. It would be nice if... Um, that's, that's another lie that no one knows. We have some damn good There's ideas. There's no point in having a lie if no one knows it. And the whole point, I think, that, I mean, Tim asked earlier what we can do about it. What I'd like to see much more, especially, as, uh, I mean, the Federation used to do a little card with um, just it's who the Federation were, and you could put your um, schedule on the back and hand it out. It was quite, quite oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the thing was, you see, that there's so much ignorance around in the Morris world. Yeah. We, yes. there's, there's no single source that I'm aware of that summarizes, um, perhaps you can advise us, that summarizes what we've discussed tonight and says these are the current thinking, you know, this is the current thinking of where the, the Morris comes from. There is one up and coming, Jerry. Good, excellent. And, and I, I say I'm having to so make science, that problem, I'm having to yeah. write one. Yeah, well, we, are, we are in the process of producing. The, the classic, the, the thing that we, that, that sort of kept this off or brought so home to us. I don't know. Is that just a simple We went to a, a fate, finish fate. We, we have Treacly to a, a trophy. Yeah, we're, sort of halfway we're thinking of calling there. ourselves Treacly to Prize yeah. Trophy Morris Dance, and he's the next in a hurry train winner. Yeah. Well. But we won this trophy's we best Morris troop this at this fate. Season. We didn't know we didn't know there was a competition, but we got this in the post about three or four weeks later. But at this fate, there was a program. Right? And somebody had written a little history of Morris dancing. And they'd obviously gone to a great, it wasn't just like half a page, but about four pages of this with illustrations. And there's quite a neat little drawing of a Northwest dancer with some arrows saying clock and flowered hat and things like this. And they, they go through all, all, of the, all of the different forms of Morris and all of the history is perfectly plausible and all totally wrong. Yeah. I, we, we're dying to find out who wrote it. Yes. Did you know that Morris started as border, developed into Cotswold, and eventually oh, flowered as Northwest? Dave Jones says so that. No, it's, it's not Dave, it's not Dave, it's not Dave not Jones. Yeah, but I'm, I'm afraid there are border people who actually, like Dave, Jay Jones, oh. trying to like sort of stir it up, as actually saying yeah. that the border more is the ancient form. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it goes back to about 1908, as far as we know. It certainly doesn't go back much before the end of the 19th century. Yeah. I mean, Sharp, who actually met people, 
Dr. Abel Arsler, who really believed it was a generate form in all the formulas, may well have been right. Am I correct in thinking also that the blackface thing only goes back really to the musical? Is it true that, that Baker and the other um, nutters, because there were other nutter sides up there, that. Um, well, Baker started in 1860. Now. Yeah, um, and they actually, they, it is documented that they came off, off musical. Um, well, they certainly blacked the faces, uh, they did a set of nature quadrilles. Yeah. They still do. Yeah, yeah, and what's yeah. more, it's all in the local newspapers at the time when they started and the mm -hmm. explanation of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a documented record. But yeah. you still get people saying that they, you know, the, the blackface is, is traditional because it goes back a long way. And some of this is this, this thing about political correctness is that there's a, a, a move to say, well, black, blacking your face is an, a, an embarrassingly incorrect thing to do today. And some sides get around that by saying, well, it's, you know, it's, it's a disguise. And that's very true. People did black their faces uh, hundreds of years ago, but not for Morris dancing, so far as we know. Um, and in any case, you can use any colour you like now. You don't have to use black. Yeah. You, can, you, you can use any colour you like. Well, I, I was just curious to, yeah, to understand what the documentation was. Else, it is, yeah, well, some well, champions. Well, it used to be a trick in... in in Bloxham, called yeah. Bloxham, 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 yeah
which shows the attitude of the West to black nations over a period of several hundred years. Yes. And yeah. the evidence okay. doesn't yeah. exist, yeah. even as recently as 1930, that blacks were regarded as being undesirable, a threat, or we had to That's not true. against them. That's not true, because the evidence does exist that, 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 that the white culture has seen them, uh, has seen black culture, uh, black oh, people well, as being... Not been able to, to, a large, to a large extent, that's American influence. Mm. The big thing in this country was before we, you know, the establishment said to the West Indian population, oh, do, we've got all these jobs, we need yeah. you. Oh, come on. Kipling. Yeah. 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 Kipling. No, yeah. no, yeah. they, they, they weren't seen as a threat in this country by ordinary <laughs> people because there weren't any around. Not as a threat. <laughs> not as a threat, but just <laughs> down there. Yeah. Yeah, but but you not know, white, not white man's burden. Um, <laughs> No, white man's board burden didn't exist before Queen Victoria. And the, the UK had no such attitude towards its colonies up until you know, until that little bit. And even so, that, that is a justification <laughs> for the duty of the white upper classes and middle classes who went abroad. The reason they went abroad, the reason for colonisation, was the need for raw materials for the industrial society that had developed in Western Europe. Sure. It was the need for oil to make soap for the weaving we were talking about earlier. Sure. But if you are going to colonise a country, you have to put a lot of people in there, you have to fire them up with so much motivation that they feel that it, you know, God has given them a task. They have to spend their life living in relative isolation from their native culture they have to adopt the, the white man's burden. That's what he was saying. Yeah. He was saying, your duty, God has given you this task. Yes. Cecil Rhodes said it another way. He said to the young men he sent up country in Rhodesia, he said, always remember you are an Englishman, and as such you have won first prize in the lottery of life. Today that would be appalling. But that was the way he motivated the people he was sending to do a and very difficult appalling. task. And it was appalling then. No, it because wasn't. Yes, it was. Well, it, it was because... Um, do you think that we could have indulged in a slave trade as late as we did if we were sending white people to the West how Indies or to the, or how to late, the, the how Americas? How late as late as we did? We when, did, when did Wilberforce We took Jamaica. Bloody old, bloody we took Jamaica in 1632, and we shipped the convicts and all the people committed at the Monmouth Rebellion to Jamaica and the West Indies. They weren't coloured people at, at that stage. The triangular trade hadn't really started when we were settling these colonies. The English invented colonisation by the way they treated the Irish. They treated the Irish as second or third class human beings, they then took this successful policy to America and applied it to the Red Indians. It was after that, when they discovered that the natives couldn't do it, they started importing blacks from Africa in large numbers. And it continued thereafter when they discovered that they could get a better work rate out of Indians by employing them at very low wages, wages rather than um, Africans, because Indians have um, a work ethic which is similar to the European work ethic, they they took a huge they took a huge number of Indians and transported them to colonies in the West Indies and Africa. South America yeah. South and, and Africa, mm -hmm. and they employed those not as slaves technically, but on staff got wages. Yeah, yeah it, it is. Not something which is um, racially specific. The British, the Europeans, and many Exploit other people anybody. exploited <laughs> anybody. Still are. Uh, so, it, it, is a, it was pure so economics. It had nothing to do with racial qualities at all. It's just that the blacks in particular were very ill equipped to cope with it. Yeah. <coughs> and there's a prejudice about degrees of what is seen as civilization. <laughs> People oh, yeah. who yeah. don't work the same way as you do and work in the same way as you believe your ancestors did, are yeah. therefore seen as more. Or don't have a written culture. Yes. Yeah. Of less work. <laughs>
Our ancestors were particularly ignorant, but they had power and they were able to impose on everybody. And it's rather sad, and we're the heirs of all the trouble that that's causing. take many generations before it changes again. But then in England the ideas of fair play and things like this between people, so that's rather disappeared in the last 50 years. You know, things are always evolving unfortunately. But that was, yeah. that was very much a 19th century invention of the public school system, which was to produce um, fodder for the great empire. Yeah, yeah. You had to do something with all these middle class people. Someone said uh, uh, cricket was a Saxon game. The whole, the great era of cricket and the evolution of cricket was during that period. <coughs> but that presumably is why the school curriculum needed upgrading. You know, kids were actually not being taught something that's useful. And then people turn around and say, but what the sister teaches isn't very helpful either. Because we're talking about a depth of knowledge of the past which you can't pass on when, when are you talking course. about the school curriculum and being upgraded? Well, it's been changed, the content of it. When? Right, in particular. There's been... Upgrading rather flat, I suppose. There's, there's been a number of education acts. There was one in 1901, there was one in 1919, there was one in 1944. And it's not by coincidence that they followed the Boer War, First World War and the Second World War, Agreed, yeah. because in each case it was found that the workforce was totally incapable of being drilled into what was then a modern army, mm -hmm. and it was necessary to educate these kids. Probably because the general staff didn't know what a modern army was. It's oh, each time, that's right. Each time, yeah. yes, we understand that. But it isn't until there was a crisis that uh, someone decided that well, perhaps we ought to. Um, prepare these children to be isn't that the the more efficiently. Isn't that the same case yeah, we're having with, you go back to the original topic, the only reason we're really discussing paganism and Morris dancing is that there are some people who are objecting, who are actually making a fuss about it now. Ten years ago, um, most people knew that most people actually thought it, and most people really thought, you know, didn't really believe it, but wanted to believe it or something. It's only becoming a problem now. Yeah, but... One of the reasons that the, the anthropology on which these views are based has actually been discredited. There are actually more people in my lifetime doing real research, that's getting to sources and talking to people about like this, than ever. And we're beginning to realise an awful lot of the past, like the weak view of history, was actually a, a minimum of facts and a maximum of model, which is what facts were fitted into. And life really wasn't like the way they said it was for a generation or more, no, a century or more. We have a much more complex picture of, say, the, the 19th century than they did when I was young. Mm. You know, that's why I've got a large collection of books. I am fascinated about the way the past has been recovered. Mm. It's only a fragmentary view of it, even now. But at least people actually go and look at uh, record books and actually discover what people paid and what they did and who was fined and all the other things that help illuminate what life was like. Yeah. You know? yeah. And the fact that <laughs> Um, up to certainly to the Chartist time, we had three or four hundred years of social protest going on all the time, you know. But as only one side was writing history and didn't want to admit to its errors, you know, it doesn't appear as part of Orthodox history. You've got to dig to find out about all the protest movements. Why blacking the faces to the eagle and so on. But this, this whole thing about history being written by people with a vested interest, continues right into oh, this Christ. history. I'm writing history from a Morris point of view now. You know, and I know it's wrong, but at least I know it's slanted in my direction. <laughs> Is it well? The, the, the Times history of the First World War wasn't published until 1926. There was no government publication of the war, an accurate description of what happened, because they were afraid of the effect it would have of saying what the slaughter was. It wasn't it? They had to suppress, 
Well, they had to suppress what happened in the First World War, and when they discharged all the troops, 1919 in this country was a time of general strike and revolution, which was much more threatening than 1926. Mm. Yeah. Scotland especially. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, you know, and this is really rather suppressed, even in our modern histories. Yeah, agreed. And, you know, things like uh, Queen Elizabeth I and Armada and all that, the other kind of heroes they were, which started off the Bloody Navy and the... Yeah, they actually didn't do a tune anything, did they? Yeah. 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 The only value of history in my mind is to establish that history was populated with people who were straightforward and honest and ordinary like us. And they did their best like we would in similar circumstances. And we shouldn't be discouraged from trying to do the things that we have to do. No, there's no way of changing the past. It doesn't really matter what Oliver Cromwell thought and what he did. It happened. Why he felt obliged to do it is an interesting question to see whether there were, in fact, precursor events and so on which encouraged him to do what he did in Ireland and so on. That's interesting. And it's interesting, for one reason, is that the Irish still actually have this weird belief about Cromwell actually doing to them what the Irish had seen things that the Irish had never done to anybody themselves, the liars. <laughs> I mean, forever atrocity, you know, I mean, the trouble with the Irish over the years is that the English perpetuated atrocity after atrocity on them. But as they did the same in between, it was never quite sure who actually was the cause. They were just keeping each other going. They were stirring it all the time. That's right. And it goes back at least to the Norman, or if not, the Viking invasions of Ireland. Yeah, it's always been like The Irish were at each other's throats when there was nobody else to fight. If you look at Slave Back to Methuselah by Bernard Shaw, sure. <clears throat> there's a reference in it to uh, the Irish, and someone says, who are the Irish? And they, were, they were a nation who lived a long time ago, and uh, they used to fight each other, but when they ran out of people to fight, they lost interest in life and died out. <laughs> anyway, the suggestion by yeah. Shaw, sure, an Irishman, is that yeah. the Irish are yeah. just naturally belligerent. Well, it the English policy towards the Irish. Like, 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 but, but, you know, that, 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 was, that was by sure. Yeah. I was but prepared to send the... It was always reckoned up. in the 17th century, the, uh, in the 18th century, the Irish were the best soldiers in the world as long as they were properly trained and properly led. You know, well, during um, Henry Cromwell's time as Lord Lieutenant, something like 40,000 Irish soldiers were allowed to go and fight for various European governments. They, in fact, meant that the Irish generals, you know, were some of the best in Europe for a while, because they actually were the best fighters for one reason or another. But that goes back a long way, Brian. I, mean, it's, it's, I think it's Herodotus who says that the Thracians, the people from northern Greece, would have conquered the entire world if they could stop fighting each other. And that's the same attitude going back. Yeah, to Certainly, it's appeared in Scotland where 25% of the Scots men of fighting age actually were in the, had been in the army at some time or the other because their economy wouldn't subsist without actually having people working out of the country and being you know, either the Swiss being able as well or bringing money in. Well, and why the wouldn't their economy the subsist? The largest export in most of the last yeah. hundred years has been manpower. Well, no. What were you going to say about sweetness? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Go on, Sue, have your say. Well, I get myself another drink. <laughs> it's a bit late. No, it's not. No, 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 no. no. It's only 20 it's past 12. I'm just getting warmed up. It's only 20 past 12. It's early. We've got the three hours, yeah. Go on, then. But while we're here, we might as well talk about it. Well, you're going to have to talk about it if you don't want. No, she does. She does. She's she's just, just, I'm she glad you brought it up. I'm glad you brought it up because I think there's a serious problem. A serious problem? Yeah. What? Well, you would also well, like, then, then lack, then, lack of reasonable then entrance. Why? Right, one at a time. Okay, the Sigma team competition. The jig competition is absolutely fine. The high standard of entries, no hassle afterwards about the decisions of the judges generally, but for whatever reasons. Uh, 
It will yeah, change. It's the problem with the venue this year and that'll change, but you know, it's a small thing really. The competition itself is good, it's enjoyable and it's a good standard and it's well thought of by everybody. The team competition has been dogged with problems for years and uh, which sort of almost came to a head this year in that there was few entries this year, like last year there was hardly any entries until the day, the day before. I don't think that's been only the last couple of years, it's always, well, been, yeah, it's it's always, always been over yeah. the last 24 hours or so. You know, yeah. Some, sometimes it's better than others but certainly uh, there's been questions whether it should be cancelled in the last few yeah, years. That's right. And um, so really what we're doing is canvassing some opinion. It can either be got rid of or it can be done in a different manner. And um, we'll see, Sally and I got our thoughts on what we think about it, which sort of, I'm not saying go particularly one way heavily, one way or the other, but it'd be nice to have some other opinions. Perhaps why it isn't working, if, if teams actually really don't like it, why it is they don't like it, uh, is this the situation on the venue on, why we don't get top quality entries in the same way that we do in the Dukes. I don't think one of the problems is actually having complete teams there. Yeah, we're just yeah, but I mean, on the Sunday, I mean, there's loads of teams. There's dozens of teams, on the front. I mean, on the front. Yeah, they want to be on the front. Why? What's it? Why? Yeah. Why? Why? I mean, I all the jig dancers are on the front as well. I yeah, know. I want to know what my side is. Don't, it's don't it's go to and dance on the front and don't enter the competition. Yeah. Having yeah. said that, when we, one of them did enter the competition, we actually framed a star from the small place that wasn't big enough. Mm. We had to do it in the common room, you know. Oh, oh yeah, the council yeah. chamber last year. That, was, that, was, that was Derek panicking. That was an unfortunate ever. problem last that was year. A cock -up. And perhaps <laughs> the venue is, wasn't right this year either. No, the ven well, well, what do you think? I mean, I thought the venue this year was better than being in the marquee. We were in the yeah. arena dance marquee. Right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, but there are two uh, problems. It, it depends what it's for, that's the problem, and, and it's... Oh, but it, it advertises itself as the premier dance competition. But it isn't. It well, it's the only one, and what there's absolutely one is there? no marketing behind it at all. Well, it's hardly right. announced marketing. by anybody. Uh, any, every, if you go to Sigmouth, you know it's there, but nobody else knows. There's, there's no kudos, effective kudos to winning it. There's no publicity there to used the winners. To be. Uh, it, I mean, I'm not criticising, you know, the organisation uh, by individuals who think have done a damn good job, but what I'm saying is that if, if you're claiming it's the Premier Dance Competition, then it needs to be run as if it was the Premier Dance Competition, and that means putting a hell of a lot more effort into it. Why aren't uh, you saying about entries in the last 24 hours? Why aren't the entry forms in, in every Morris Federation newsletter? Why they aren't they are in the ring doing the we ring said the, and the Morris yeah. uh, the Actually, the publicity the paper, paper one, does go out. No, yeah. it goes out to the Federation of Morris, Morris and the Wing. Morris and, the the and it says in there, dance competition, the, the Morris dance competition. Yeah, but why is exactly it in the Oaks side literature the literature as well? Yeah, why isn't yeah. it recognised? Yeah. Langoston, they advertise all over the place. Mm. Yeah, because it's Langoston. Well, where else, I mean, that's interesting. Where yeah, else could you advertise it? I mean, a, a flyer goes out to every Morris team that belongs to an organisation. <laughs> But, you know, if we're having competition at Sidmouth, surely, you know, throw Devon or the South of England and so on, they're all part of the publicity of their Sidmouth first, and there are these competitions. Uh, that's no use advertising because, in fact, you do it in a place where you can't get a big crowd. Mm -hmm. Only season ticket holders get in the marquee over the years, so it's an in-joke to start with. Uh, I mean, I, I think they actually get a reasonable number of pay on the door, don't they? Yeah, yeah well, most, yeah. they're mostly people who are in. The problem is that half the Morris world think that competitions have totally nothing to do with Morris at all, and that nobody actually treats the competition as being serious. And part of that is that they there are years when very few people have entered, very few teams have entered that are worth competing against. But, I mean, but that's only the case. In, I mean, that's only been the case in the last. Three, four years, maybe. No, uh, no. Well, no. It's, no, it's recovered it's in the last three or four years because it went, it went, went downhill down dramatically. End of the eighties, early nineties, yeah, it went downhill, yeah. and then it recovered greatly. It's on its way up. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. And then the next year was good as well. But if oh, was, there was any, the rest um, of the entry that historical good? precedence yeah. as yeah. to how they judge things? Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. I think you've got to make. Yeah. I think it's when you send up, out yeah. when you send out publicity, it has to be I mean, clear did, what did the points be. I mean, the rules were things like you know. Oh no. Ah, at Kirklingen they did. They, it's a dance or, or a tune was defined, you know, um, when Bill Kimber went as a boy, they, they were actually given a Saturday night and they had to dance as a handkerchief and a stick dance. Oh. You know, and when you think of the tune Saturday night, you know, it's inconceivable. <laughs> well, that's true, but I mean, if, when, when you've got um, different types of dance entering, I, mean, I think you're going to continually have arguments over uh, trying to compare chalk with cheese. Except that well, when, half, when half, half Noon yeah. and Hammersmith were there, most people... They were so superior. Most people... And then there were two other teams who were... I mean, yeah. Most people... I think you... Were you on the judging panel like Yes, you were. Which one? Half Noon Half Noon one. Yes. And most people I know had the same order that the judges did. Yes. And the one or two people who didn't have that order had very specific personal reasons for not having that order. Yes. About yeah. what they actually think is... Um, basically... They were people who didn't like what Half Moon were doing. Like they were women. <laughs> or or yes. they didn't like them being serious about you know, being solemn about things. Yes. 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 But, but I mean, most are, people, I mean, are you when judging a, 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 a sort of show performance as opposed to possibly polished dance? That's the way the instructions the judge read. Yeah, it's yeah. a show. There's no question. I mean, different judges are responsible. You know, get more marks to give for particular aspects of it. You know, like technique and musicianship and things of that sort, you know, uh, that's not a reason. I have to say, as been a judge for a number of times, the marking way is cumbersome, it takes time, and we're being cheated by the MC all the way through to come up with an answer quickly. And therefore the thoughts, although the judgment, I think, of the teams tends to be free, reasonably sound, the comments aren't. They are, I mean, when I've actually done the next thing, I've just scribbled down what people say. They sort of give me a one line of what they feel about the side and things like this, and I'm stuck with these <laughs> statements to make. The problem is you get a whole stack of negative ones because people tend to notice. Of course it is. <laughs> I mean, the first reaction well, like is they like were two minutes they they over good time of... and it seemed longer. <laughs> <laughs> it's a judge structure to judge yourself. They say you want positive statements, but they've got to be positive, good statements about them. And in fact, that's all they get. Yeah. But the judging criteria and so on, there's very, very little difference between the jig competition yeah. and the team competition, the yet same. you don't have the problem in the jig competition. I mean, they have the same publicity, they have mm. the same judging yeah. criteria. Yeah. It is just the same. Yeah. But you also have the same problems with people looking in. Yeah. Let's face it, um, yeah. an hour or two, well no, a day before the jig competition, there were two yeah, people yeah, entered this year, and we had 19 we entries yeah. by yeah. the yeah. Sunday yeah. So what, yeah. what, what can we do about it? I think you've, no, got, only 12 inches, yeah. 12 you've got two distinct problems there. Um, in the jig competition, people who are going to enter competitions, there's a strong element of ego. Okay? So if you happen to have a big ego, and you want to dance a jig, fine, you need a musician. If you want to dance in a team competition, you have to find six big egos. Making them work together is difficult. Getting them to practice together is much more difficult than the jig competition where the dancer can practice by himself. Can practice and it's a very himself. strange sort of situation, really, because most teams don't work in that sort of performance venue. They don't, they don't right. have those sorts of performance venues for the most part. Now let me speak as an adjudicator at other festivals, not within the folk world, you know. I have, over quite a few years now, picked up a nice tidy income. When I say tidy, you get £120 for <coughs> days adjudicating, you know, folk classes. We're missing all this, kid. Yeah. It's, it's, it all. <laughs> oh, it's well worthwhile, you know. Um, I think he works quite hard for some it's a, a oh, you, you work for a time. I didn't get paid for adjudicating today. What? <laughs> yeah. You got right. You got the right I answer. I wash my I think you've got what it was worth. Thank you, dear. What you got was first use of my work. horns. Yeah, you're right. Okay, I'll give you that one. It wasn't much. That's all we had to offer. Yeah. Um, no, I, as an adjudicator, for example, every other year I do the Portsmouth Music Festival. 
uh, for which you know we've made Margaret and I made a presentation at you know best of the show award and things like that. They don't get a large number of entries, but they have consistent entries of sides who take it seriously and practice quite a few weeks to put together a show. The requirement is a show between 15 and 20 minutes long, and you're judged from the moment your first glimpse, as it were, to the time you disappear. Right? The people come in, they do, they have long enough to do a normal type show with the palaver, the back chat, the fooling, all the things coming like that. And they have a partisan crowd who cheer their own lot on and things like this, you know. And it goes on for between an hour and two hours, depending on the number of entries. This and everybody who goes along have yes. all said to me, it was one worth the effort to prepare, and it was very enjoyable even to come along. And it's wonderful to see Victory Sober, for example, <laughs> you know, and things like that. Well, I mean, you, the Victory men you often win the word competition, wonderful, was I not because actually when sober, they dance extremely well, and so on. You know. At that level, there doesn't seem to be a problem. Except that so why for years, Victory, despite the fact that within the commuter, you know, even this commuting distance from Portsmouth, there are, or there were in those days, at least half a dozen teams, Victory eventually wrote this pleading letter to King John saying, do come along, it's horribly boring and embarrassing, turning up and being given the trophy because we're the only people here. Ah. Come along and give us some competition. In my time with Portsmouth, I got the competition rules changed, mm. you know, and I have never been either as an adjudicator or as a part of a team entering, where in fact it's been that bad. Yeah, but the, the, it was the, the year that Minden Rose entered for the first time, or King John's yep. entered for the first time. The previous two or three years, Victory had walked had had a walkover because they weren't there. And we're going back. Year before. We're going Did, back. I'm not sure about the year years. before because Minden Rose entered that year because I've been adjudicated the year before, and I had arranged for the two adjudicators who who did duty that particular mm. night. Is it worth thinking some sort of radical ideas and? Accepting that they're not going to be right, but they might spark something that might improve. I mean, we've had several suggestions, um, or, or half right. suggestions. I mean, Roy mentioned the historical precedent, which is a very radical idea of saying, right, here you are, you've got a tune, you've got two hours, get on with it. I mean, it's a very different, it's almost like what we were, well, it is what we were doing this afternoon. I mean, that that's but a different, I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm not Are there arts festivals who do that, you know, in other words, in different classes like the children's or juvenile classes, they have set tunes, set dance and things like this. It is not a way, I mean, it gets youngsters in because the whoever's teaching knows what to do. But it's not a very efficient way. With okay. adults, no. adults need really their own freedom to choose what they do. Second, second radical suggestion, that the competition is actually the Sunday lunchtime on the front, that it's a, a freestyle competition that you send out a pack of judges, you send them between we tried uh, that in one the, and... We tried that at the Bath Festival, the competition was too hard. One, they were dancing a, in front of the Abbey to the public, and then the second half of the competition was actually in the halls, in the assembly rooms. Right? It didn't work, because the circumstances in which each team danced outside the Abbey were different. They inevitably different times of day, different audiences, different weather, and things like this. It actually didn't work. But if you had enough adjudicators or enough you know, reporters, yeah. there is a limited time when along the front, you know, say 12:30 to 1:30 on you that. You can't moderate it. Well, no, but perhaps what you're then doing is like you're. you're I mean, what about the double thing? One of the problems with the the Morris competition is that it's trying to do all sorts of different things, and you end up doing none of them, really. Yeah. Um, I mean, if, if you specialise and say, right, part of the competition is about working with an audience, right, let's focus that on, on let's say, the, the watching them on the seafront. Part of it is also about structuring and, and crafting you know, a, a performance and technical excellence. So we'll focus just on that in the, in the bit in, inside. I was given to understand that the... The performance, the, the dance competition at Sydney was intended 
to be a competition for people doing the sort of things that the book teams at Sidmouth do. In that, yes, it's not quite the same circumstances you normally find yourselves in. It's a bit more formal. It may well be on a stage. If it's not on a stage, it's in something similar. And the idea, I mean, one of the ideas that you might get, you might get teams who might want to have back on, on the main arena, but it's intended to be that sort of show. But at the moment, now, it doesn't this work. Is, well, there's um, an element of double pleading. I think it said, uh, special meeting. Um, you're saying children must have defined, or we normally have defined dance tune, etc. Teachers have to have. Well, the children's competition. You teach children. Yeah. The children's competition. Adults, we give them the freedom. What we actually give them the freedom to do is to control the conditions under which they perform. Yeah, what's wrong with that? Well, yeah, but uh, if, you the, give them the, if you give them the, the right rules boy. and what they're going to be judged by, then they know the parameters in which they make their choices. About if you're actually judging uh, people who dance, do you want to judge their pure technical ability to dance, or their ability to do reflate with an audience, their ability to perform Both. as dancers under a whole variety of contexts? All of it. One, we don't, one of we don't the charms of cricket is that you play your innings under possibly entirely different circumstances to the opposition. And if you are good at the game, you adapt to the changed circumstances. It might be the circumstances are totally weighed against you. How many more starts in play for people? I would hope most of them, otherwise they're ignorant gits. <laughs> anyway. Well, when I'm well that, that dismisses <laughs> all the women of it. Um, Not at all. Starters. There's a very flourishing women's cricket team. We want the World Cup. Yeah, this one the English comment. Yeah. Well, yeah, back to the... Uh, the back 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 to what, I'm, what I'm saying is, I don't think it is unreasonable to set a variable, i.e. the audience. If the audience is good on one occasion and poor on another, you have to assess how they interact with the audience under those circumstances. You're right. It makes it more difficult for the judges. Well, in my opinion, the way the judges' rules are set, they're biased towards Cops of Morris, and they're certainly biased against Border, and against the entertainment troops. Uh, they actually are aimed for excellence in dancing, which yeah. Border teams don't seem to understand, yeah. Yeah. It's 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 it, it? Come on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I have yeah. a, a perennial problem with uh, a side who I appear to have slated. I listen to them on my, the video, I buy the videos and I look at it because I'm interested in the dancing shit again. And I upset whoever it was. I even forgot who it is now. That's dreadful, isn't it? That's no, oh, that's a good start. It would be helpful. Flag crackers. Oh, it's flag crackers, you know. Yeah. Flag crackers. But actually, they were all they're, the not, video, they're not difficult to observe. <laughs> when I look at the they video, are awful. it was a dismal performance on that particular occasion, not like to their normal standard, but quite a long way. Like the um, masking lot. Well done. Well done. They're all so This year. Well, refused, as it were, to do all the things that makes the magical eight side in the competition. They just came in, said, we're doing so and so, and did it. Not very well. And not very well. But they're not magical outside, they're boring outside as well, Roy. But Roy, you said it's biased in favour of Cotswold teams, and there wasn't a Cotswold team in the competition this year. That's right. And in fact, I mean, if you well, look at that, how, can, how can you ever get somebody like the Fez Ed, who are absolutely superb in this year. you know, mm -hmm. things like this, you know, how can you actually have a competition where they're always going to be bottom? Because they're, 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 they're not always bottom. They're not always bottom. Yeah, 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 well, they don't obey the rules, you're quite right, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. They they mean, why the hell do they enter it when they don't fit? That's yeah. right. What yeah. you're trying to get us to say, Roy, is that the criteria for judgment have to be changed. Yeah, but I mean, it's a Morris dance competition. Would you like a oh, but the point is, it's a Morris, Morris dance competition. <coughs> but it's a Morris dancing. I mean, you know, is it, or is it you Morris looking at people dancing? who are dancing? 
if, if you regard it as... Your you, 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 you keep saying they are very entertaining, implying that they ought to be judged on entertainment value. As well. As but well. I mean, that ought to be a significant factor in the judgment. In that case, you are saying the adjudication um, specifications need to be modified. So you see, what you see is modified. But you see, you then get an argument. With, it, you get an argument with somebody like no, Plymouth, it. who came, who came along, and they said, "But we did Morris dancing, and we stuck to the rules. We we were under ten minutes, and we did a show. We fitted all the rules." And Hammer Smith, who were who Plymouth. Hammersmith, who oh, overran, yeah. didn't get penalised for it. That year, that was and nice. I was standing yeah, next to the guy pushing the bloody like like rush car. I couldn't say, well, you were crap, because if you tripped me up, I'd have been killed. You know? was just, well, they, were, they weren't any good. Yeah, I know. No. Because they managed to stay with the time. Yeah, but you can walk so up, walk so off. So what is the criteria that dance is measured by? Seven champions and Shropshire Bedlams, when entering something like that, would tend to walk away with a prize because they're excellent, they're excellent, and they're entertaining. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. You know, because they, they are performance art rather than a group of Morris dancers. But they dance as well. They're dancing as well. What do you mean, Aren't they both? Why can't they be the the performance, good performers and Morris dancers? No, no, no. I think they do both. They said performance art. And there's a world of difference. Between Would you get enough signs if you said uh, this year we, you know, we want to see the best Sherbourne dance? Uh, or no, but Sherbourne would stand no. up and say we have to be the best because we're Sherbourne. The rest of well, well, I mean, you are there for. You are there for. I had a co went to competition where a where a Brist no, a Bampton side entered and they were fourth, <laughs> <laughs> even though they were first on my list. I know, I'm a sucker for judging because <laughs> every time I get involved, afterwards I think, we didn't do that very well, and I must do better next time, and <coughs> the sun comes along, and it's only marginally better. Perhaps it needs something like a... A, a better sort of set of judges, <laughs> is what I would recommend. <laughs> it, perhaps it needs a straight jacket, oh, because then. actually you're often liberated if you set yourself some silly rule, it's like, you know, writing sonnets or something, isn't it? Oh, 14 lines, yeah, yeah. I mean, perhaps you almost need to say, I mean, I'm not seriously suggesting, you know, it's a competition in, in yeah. Dancing Sherbourne, but it might be something like a competition in, if, it, if it's just Cotswold in presenting a handkerchief dance and a stick dance, end of story. You know, it might, I, I don't, I'm not saying that's the right restriction, but maybe something like is that. that. Is that why, is that why the competition is so different? Looking, looking because you're much more constrained. It's much more constrained, yeah. yeah. Well, 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 and yeah, well, I mean, down. we've had this, we've had this criticism <coughs> often, oh, only Cotswold <coughs> can win, but if a long sort of thing, it's a question of a set of excellences, not just less things. Every time he's won, as a Morris virgin, somebody tell me what the criteria is for measuring Cotswold sides or measuring a Morris side in a competition. The four main judging categories, one on the music, yeah. performance, yeah. or presentation, yeah. and two on, uh, one on dance technique, Technical and one on what we call artistic appreciation. Yeah, it's just like well, that's, okay. That mean? that's okay, but if what you look at mean? Well, it's <laughs> Depends who you yeah. ask. Right. That, that has the four categories the least well defined. I'm quite happy. Right okay. That's okay. Yeah, well, I, I judged on artistic appreciation. I found it quite tough. I mean, there there was a um, bit woolly, it, but uh, Sally. There's, there's, Sally. There's, Sally. I think there was an area there. I think maybe not but you have a right. problem when you have a, a clog, a border, mm. a cotswold, a sword team, and so on, mm. and you say, how do you compare these? Uh, my solution was, in fact, I've been around a long time and I know, I know what good is in each of these character categories. Mm -hmm. And you can judge a border side by, as it were, the standard of border sides. Yeah. Really, the standard they're setting themselves. You know? yeah. And you can say to a border side, by your, the standards that you're proposing, or professing, as it were, there, you're crap. <laughs> you can't actually use those words in adjudicating, but that's, in effect, what's wrong with most of the border side. With border sides, <laughs> <laughs> there are better sides around Sidmouth this year than ever entered the competition. 
Yeah, yeah, but I, but I, one I, of, perhaps one of the difficulties well, is well, that the, there was a rapper side in Bufty going <coughs> around the town, but far better than mm. the side that was actually booked to dance on the shows. Sure. Uh, perhaps, the perhaps one of the difficulties is Roy said that he's you know worked through years of watching dancing and he knows how he can compare. Most people don't know that. Most Cotswold dancers don't understand how sword works. Longsword works. Yeah. They don't know how Northwest works. Therefore, they well, don't. They, they don't really know how they're being compared. If you go into the jig competition, you know what you know what yeah. the ground rules are. You don't in the same way because you can't understand what other people are trying to do. That's bold. No, we enter the non That's, a that's, that's, a that's nonsense, box. actually, yeah, Tony. Three. Because <laughs> I, I've never danced rapper, but I know. A you know good rapper team when I see one. You know, see one, I, you when know you see high spec. I know. Oh, all right, yeah. yeah, I know that Stone yeah, Monkey are really good, and I, you know, but there, there was I know that East Saxon are actually pretty boring. <laughs> Technically, they might be wonderful. There was, no, but there's there still an issue because Sorry, they're trying to work in different venues, different situations, different length of dance. There are different reasons for doing it. Those aren't true of the jig competition. Yeah. The and jig competition. I think the other thing is with the jig competition is that it, basically you're being judged by people who you. It's, it's very much more of a close, a close thing. Most people in the jig competition know each other. Most of them know most of the judges. It's yeah. very much more of a peer group thing. Yeah. And yeah. It, it, you know, it's and we are judging the people we consider best at something we consider important. The dance competition was dumped on on Morris Will by the festival as far as I. It was decided it would be a good thing to have. I, I understand it was John Dow, wasn't it, saw the bath composition? Yeah. And that's what made him introduce it. Yeah. Yeah. How well does a bath composition work? Well, the year that he saw it, it worked wonderfully. With the jig competition, a bath oh, yeah. last year, yeah. Yeah. Well, well, maybe it's a question of who the judges are. <laughs> elsewhere <laughs> and things like that. There's some kudos that go with it. The side the that wins the Richard Dance competition gets nothing out of it at all. It's, it's not that's experience, you see. It's because over the years, the winners of oh, the jig competition is very good standard. Yeah, over the years, yeah, the winner of the dance the team competition it's hasn't open. always been good enough to yeah. go anywhere else. Yeah. There was a comment in, in Chandler's book, I, I remember reading, about uh, <laughs> Lee Fields <laughs> dancing com in competition against someone, and I forget who they were. And the comment was that um, although Leafield were by far the better dancers, they were defeated right at the beginning because one of them started on the wrong foot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, their criteria then must have been not necessarily no, you the, know, the most entertaining side. Somebody got it wasn't it wrong. that. The yeah, competition, the <coughs> rules were things like you start the figure with the left foot and the second half with the right foot, you turn out. No, simple rules of that, which may require you to fudge and things of that sort. There were also judges who didn't like faint steps, fudging. Mm. Yeah, but you <laughs> knew that, and you knew the rules. So that's it about quality of the dance or which dance you did. No, no you're rules. being judged on mistakes. Yes. If you want to see what happens if you put a very heavy competitive element onto Morris dancing, another bit on that tape we were watching from Abbott's Bromley is Platt Bridge. Yeah. And there are they're doing their dancing and they've got their partisan crowd. Yeah. And you know, when they get to the bits when they, they finish the dance and go to the dance off, um, you know, the crowd go berserk. They're screaming and shouting and banging their feet and all that oh. sort of thing. I'm told there are judges wandering through the dance, checking well, the lines yeah. and, and things like this. It's 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 a wonderful piece of video to watch. I mean, I've so talked to judges that know. Are we not, are we not in danger of taking ourselves too seriously? Mm. Yeah. Is that is what is degenerating about what we're doing? I mean, I go out, I dance one style, I've danced one style for six years. That's all I know. I don't know if you're down, I don't know how you did that, I don't know if you're in, I go my way to weekends and other things. So what? Do you when I go out, when I go out and dance and I can inspire to you yeah. on my side, and I know nothing for better Morris and there are dancers in my side that have danced for other sides and they have experience. I go out and I, you know, for me, I go out and I dance and I dance because I enjoy it. And I want to dance the best I can dance. And I also go out and dance because it entertains people that are watching. Yeah. 
And that's why they do it. I don't go out and think, well, if no, perhaps we entered a competition in three years' time, it may impress the judge. I go out and dance. Mm. Yeah. And we're but sitting here discussing. No, the, the, well, are no, you yeah. doing this the right way? Perhaps you shouldn't. Have Some done of that. us. Maybe are... if we did that, it would look no. better. <coughs> no, the, well, who cares? No, well, so I do. I do because you yeah. your, your face every every so often with the emotional strain of being responsible <laughs> for some aspect of it. <laughs> but to an extent. What I'm concerned with really, are we talking about the crappy Morris competition? Or the Morris crappy competition. I've seen crappy ah. Morris. We have crappy Morris where we live. But we're always going to have crappy Morris. <laughs> it will always be. But why should we have a crappy competition? People, people, people like I work with yeah. ask them what I do in my spare time. I say, I'm Morris dancer. And they say, oh, great, you go out and get drunk. I say, no, there are three echelons. From what I can see, there are three echelons in Morris. There are dancers that only dance for other dancers. There are dancers like the time that I dance with that go out and dance the best they can. After we finish dancing, we go out and yes, we drink. And there are also dancers that go out and move yeah. around to music. <laughs> and they, <laughs> no, and that is it. That's how I can see it. And I live in a very basic world, I work in a very basic world. And you know, there are dancers that are up there. Okay, I can't do that. I physically can't do that. I dance on the side that's there. That can go out and look good. And we, you know, we do win things. We have one all the awards and stuff. But I wouldn't say that at the time. <laughs> um, but you know, we've been there, we've done it, you know, we've been the best, and now we're the 30th. It's not a problem. When I go out to dance, I go out to dance because I enjoy it, and it gives the people that are watching me dancing a good time. Yeah. My, let's say, we're, my we're side discussing three three points here. enter Does competitions because the satisfaction they to get in dancing to a better standard than they normally dance during the year. Mm. They come away like last time. We were looking last week at a video of our last performance, and we had to say we danced incredibly well for ourselves, mm -hmm. and all the performers are intensely proud of themselves, mm -hmm. and it washes over the rest of the season as far as we're concerned. They know they can get to this too many shorts, and dancing <laughs> excellence is something that all Morris dancers have in their heart, mm, yes. even if they can't achieve it, they'd like to. So, I mean, that's the right attitude to go into the competition. Yeah. 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 Therefore, you need to publish what the purpose of the competition is, what it's attempted to do, and, well, and, and given that, how you're going to arrange the, the marking of the judges. I mean, if it's intended to do the most... I mean, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't make plain that there's going to be 40 percent more this, 20 percent that, and so on. Well, I think that needs to be well, it maybe needs to be highlighted. Isn't there somewhere? I think the information is available. I mean, I don't. Yeah. I'm not it's sure that we can advertise the purpose. The trouble is that the purpose well, of the festival is different to what we're talking well, about. Well, the purpose, the, the, purpose the, 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 the purpose of the competition, not the purpose of the festival, the purpose of the competition. If you don't fulfill the purpose of the festival, they won't be there. Well, if you look at the step dancing competition... I'm sorry. We there. Can we put this chicken in that egg situation? Unless winners have a given a choice. A chance, as it were, and say, you're good enough to be invited to dance in the show of the sea bin. You'll never get the standard, you'll never get people to good enough to do it. Well, no, they never said that to start with the jigs. It happened because it was good enough. On the other extreme, probably wouldn't. Yeah. I mean, I'd be interested in the results. Of the but you, we've already got a division between the two competitions <coughs> now. <coughs> one's well, good. Well, it's because of the level of, level of the standards. So, uh, there's one other the point. Is, is but you don't that make the point to everybody and say the standard's not good enough to get invited into the festival. All that happens then is people don't enter at all. Because they're frightened of losing. Because that would, you know, I used to dance for that law. And there's no way you, despite the fact that they make this point about this, the title's got prize in it. They've not entered a competition since 1993. Well, what's the difference? I mean, that's for rapper teams. Going for competitions like the show tomorrow, it's like, you know, life, the universe and everything. If you're a rapper team, you want to compete. That's natural. So what's the difference between those and other other boys teams? Why? I mean, they all put their heads on the block. All of them do, every, every time. 
Yeah, yeah, but it's it's All we have to do is actually say the winner of the competition is so and so, and this is why we thought they were good. I don't comment on the others at all. Then you won't get any. Then there's no incentive for people to go in, even if they know they're not going to win. One of the things about going to the gym. You just said about the trouble about sides you don't want to lose. Yeah. And if you're not first, you're not. But if you're a team. If you're going in for a jigs competition, you do get encouragement. No. Well, it's not Mr. Bradford, because he's still around. Uh, because his encouraging comment was, Steve, that was ordinary, I've seen because you better. Seven years ago. Right. Yeah. 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 But um, yeah. if my yeah. even said you can do better, yeah. yeah. that was ordinary. Yeah. That's the whole point. But you do get comments. Go out of the people in this room would let their team go in for a competition then. Sorry? Who? I personally would like to see a dozen or fifteen sides in the competition. But you'll never see that. We have to short their... And after last year, I think both my sides... But they won't go in for it. The opposition They won't. No, no, no I think part of that's my about, fault. About, um, science, because I pushed them into it when we were two years old. Yeah. There are many sides, but although some of them will go down to the seafront to dance, not all of them have, therefore will have what you might consider to be an A team. And it really is quite hard to talk to people if you travel for, for you know, three, four hours to do a couple of hours dancing on the seafront. And then, but you end up with a competition for those seed sites that are staying for the week. You know? And that's all right as long as that's what it's recognised what it is. There's an awful lot of comments after people You see, one of the things that Tony Rankin said yesterday was that English Morris is different because you, you have competitions and you enter them. And we did a quick check and thought, well, yeah, 3% well, you back here, 3% of the teams in the country, approximately, had entered. You, you, you put that percentage onto America, and that means that three people, or four people, across the whole of American Moritz, want to enter a competition. But on the grounds they're not going to be in the same team, they'll never get together. It's, it's a very small percentage who want to go into competition. It's so why do we have it at all? I don't ask the bloody festival. Well, they have it because it makes, it fills the marquee. Whatever we say about it, you fill the marquee. You they get a very, very, very big audience. It's popular. And they enjoy it. They enjoy it. So why the hell should the festival stop it? How we're tap on to them. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Those heads would win every time. Yeah. <laughs> but they probably put more effort into oh, yeah. that than most They put half the effort they put into the, into the, into the competition, into learning how to dance properly. They'd be unstoppable. Yeah. Yes. Well, that's not, yeah. yeah. So. What you have to think about is not so much why sides aren't coming, but if the side does come, what has to happen to make them come? That's the problem with quality indicators, though, isn't it? Processes that have got them there. I'm not saying that. Sorry. The problem with quality indicators in general. Somebody said that it's the first head. This one. Oh, yeah. That's one. If you publish the quality indicators, the criteria, people work to those and ignore other things. That's why you can't look at it. And it's the same in work, it's the same in work. For example, I said it's not my case, I think for West Union and local ones to enter. The fact that occasional team has to walk away and You've been lucky, but that's the case. You have to be from that. You have to be from that. Get a cocktail team. 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 Get a cocktail team.
I'm interested in the you can just watch it. Yeah, I mean, I think that's right. But what we need is a Well, I don't care, the answer might be... Well, 